Okay, my allergies are whack and I'm a very coffee boy, so let's do this. Greetings and salutations, gamers. My name is Kyle, also known as Gamers Week, and welcome back to the Dark Souls. Hold on just a second. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I see. Okay, according to this very real document I'm reading, which looks like a dehydrated phone book, I'm supposed to call this a challenge for semantical reasons. Also so the algorithm will like me. Last time, we took on the low-level one-shot in Dark Souls Remastered. It was a fun run to route out, and we managed to be one of the first in the world to actually complete the run. But today, we're making our way back to the land of Drang Lake to knock out the next magic-only run. Welcome to how I became, not actually, but for the purposes of this bit, legally obligated to tell you that I am now a registered hex offender. Before we talk about the actual run though, let's get into the rules. For starters, any damage dealt by us needs to be done using hexes. No other magic types or the use of weapons is allowed. Any other armor and rings is fair game, although just to help even the playing field a bit this time, I also omitted the use of shields. And by omitted, I mean I forgot to equip one for the entire run. We'll be going after every single boss in the game, but once again there's 41 of them, so don't expect excruciating detail on every boss. And finally, no major glitches will be allowed. One last thing before we get started, it would mean the world to me if you press the subscribe button. Let's me and the YouTube algorithm know that I'm still alive and there's still something writhing and breathing deep down in this mortal coil. And that's about it. I hope you are all having a wonderful day, and without further ado, this is the Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin Hexes Only Challenge, I guess. We name our character Ansem this run, because darkness is the heart's true essence, and select the sorcerer class. It has the best starting stat spread for hexes, which will be requiring both faith and intelligence. Hexes also require both a staff and a chime, and while both are easy to get early in the game, the chime is a bit easier, so starting off with the staff is an added bonus. Just like any other challenge run, we've begun at a wall. A boss cuts off our access to the first hexes teacher, but it just so happens that the boss is the dragon rider. There's a pretty easy way that we're familiar to deal with him, so we'll take that route. Either count his steps or use a visual cue and run past the Dragon Rider and he'll throw himself into the deep. After talking to Lissy and convincing her to move the Rotunda path to the Huntsman's Copse, we can spend our souls to begin juicing our stats. The three stats that will be the most important for this run are going to be Intelligence, Faith, and Attunement. Dark Damage Scaling is based off of your Intelligence and Faith. Specifically, whichever stat is lower is what the damage is determined by. For example, if you have 40 intelligence and 20 faith, then your dark damage will be scaled to your level 20 faith. And of course, attunement is needed to attune more spells. But hexes tend to require a large number of attunement slots, so it's going to need more juice than usual. That being said, we're putting more focus into intelligence than faith early on so we can reach the stat requirements for the spells we want early. Then we head back to Falcon and pick up Dark Orb. We make our way to the Force of Fallen Giants to purchase Leningrass Key and collect the Mansion Key from Kale before making a trip back to Majula. We're after a Pharos Lockstone and some standard Titanite to get some upgrades for our Catalyst, and after purchasing two more from Mr. Green, we can take the staff up to plus three. We'll use our newly upgraded Stick of Darkness to send Maul into the Shadow Realm so we can pick up his armor set. It increases the amount of souls we get from enemies and bosses, and we're going to need a lot of those early on. Using the Pharos Lockstone back in the forest, we can get our hands on the Chloranthe Ring, which will make a very noticeable boost to our stamina recovery. I'm not convinced that we have enough damage to put down the last giant, but No Man's Wharf does have some goodies I'd like to collect and a boss we might be strong enough for. Specifically, we can hunt down a Fragrant Branch of Yore, an item we need to focus getting several of early on, and some more Titanite Shards. This leads us to the Flexile Sentry. I actually forgot to put the large Titanite into my Catalyst before attempting to take the Sentry on, which would have probably made a noticeable difference. 
Regardless, this boss fight is easy enough, and if I had arrived fully stocked on spells and upgraded, I probably could have ended this fight without using an amber herb. It's a small price to pay though for my mistake. Using the souls we've obtained from the Flexile Sentry, we can buy the Silver Cat Ring and begin to push to having 2020 for our intelligence and faith. After that, we can put the Silver Cat Ring to use and begin our descent into the Medulla Pit. For now, we'll use the Ledge Punch to skip past the Royal Rat Vanguard and make our way down. On the way down, there's a Crystal Lizard we can take out who will drop a Dark Knight Stone, which we'll use for a Dark Infusion fairly soon. A Sublime Bone Dust later and we've made our way to the gutter. This place is even more useful than usual, not only having two fragrant sticks, but also having a pot that contains the Hex Dark Fog. This is going to be one of our more potent spells this run, but more on that later. After picking up some more levels, we head into the Shaded Woods where we can pick up some of the usual magic gear. Beside a tree is the Clear Bluestone Ring plus one, which will increase our spellcasting speed. Up on a cliff, there's the Chlorinthy Ring plus one, which is even more stamina recovery. And finally, we can use another Fragrant Branch to grab the Lion Mage set for even more casting speed. With most of our early game setup complete, we can take on the Last Giant. Dark Fog and Practicality is the same type of spell as Poison or Toxic Mist. If you've seen our Pyromancy Only challenge already, you're pretty aware of how strong Poison effects are, but for the new people, damage over time is insanely strong in Dark Souls 2. We clear the Giant with little issue. Pursuer is next on my list, and even if it takes two Dark Fogs to start ticking, it doesn't matter. Damage over time plus decent damage from Dark Orb makes this an easy fight to navigate, and another boss down. With the Pursuer down, we have enough souls to take our Faith to 20, and with both 20 Faith and 20 Intelligence, we can speak to our Instructor Falcon to receive his gear, most notably the Sunset Staff. After that, we kill another Pursuer for the Twinkling Titanite, which we'll need for the Sunset Staff, and after discovering an invisible hollow I had never seen before, we make our way over to Macduff. Macduff will not only bring our Sunset Staff up to plus two, but we'll also use our Dark Knight Stone to infuse it with darkness. And with that, we have our setup to take on... most of the game, actually. There's still some upgrades here and there we'll be picking up, but this build is going to rocket us through most of the early and mid game. Before we begin our warpath, we can get our hands on a bit more Twinkling Titanite by taking out the second Pursuer in Lost Bastille, as well as the one in the Things Betwixt. Now let's start up the Boss Grinder. Rune Sentinels are first up, and Dark Orb damage is already taking chunks out of their health. The Hammer Trio stands zero chance. Another Pursuer later and we can make our way to Strayed, who will not only sell us more copies of the spells we have, but also Dark Hail. A pseudo Dark Bead that may not hit quite as hard, but it's still hitting harder than Dark Orb. And that's saying something. Scorpion Nascar is also easily losing chunks of her HP to each spell cast, and by weaving our way around her attacks she doesn't pose too much threat either. Afterwards, we go on a trip for more Twinkling Titanite in the Doors of Pharos before we take on the Royal Rat Authority. The little rats can be an issue if you get rat piled, but once they're out, Authority is an easy target to buckshot with Dark Hail. I'm sorry Chosen Undead, but your difficulty is in another castle. More souls for the Dark Scaling and I want to see how the Rotten goes. Even though he's got some better dark resistance than the past few, it's not enough to push this past being a standard fight with the Corpse Huddle. One Lord down and I'm still hungry for Twinkling Titanite. There's some in Earthen Peak, so let's blast our way there. Skeleton Lords are up next. Now, I would like to note here that this boss could be made even easier by picking up the Hex dead again. Unfortunately, the only way to claim it at this point is to farm it as a drop. Otherwise, you pick it up from Cloan after this boss fight. Either way, Dark Orbs of Plenty is more than enough to whittle down the horde.
After feeding the mukbang YouTuber Dark Magic, we make our way into Earthen Peak. After paying Gilligan to give us access to that Titanite I wanted, it was time to start heading towards Mytha. Now, given how easy everything so far has been, the Discord call and I decided that we wanted to see how Mytha would go without draining the poison pool. Turns out, when your health is under constant damage pressure, it helps even out the fight by a decent amount. We still do a massive amount of damage, but if we don't actively combat that damage over time from the poison, then we can die fairly rapidly. It's a matter of using life gems and Estus at the right times to keep ourselves topped off while keeping up with the damage on Mytha. It takes two tries to kill the Medusa in her own poison pool. Given how we were able to clear the boss without even draining the poison pool, I figured we might as well try her on New Game Plus. This would give us Silver Serpents plus two for a great amount of soul income, so we lit up the windmill and gave it a go. New Game Plus was actually a much more challenging prospect than I initially thought it would be. If you can get her locked into a ranged battle, then it becomes a fairly easy back and forth to manage, but her attacks and melee range are a little harder to deal with, especially when you can only take a single hit without dying. It takes a couple tries, but Mytha goes down for a second time in New Game Plus. In Iron Keep, Dark Fog makes quick work of the invaders and we push our way to the Smelter Demon. Dark Fog works on this thing for reasons I can't comprehend, but you don't need a degree in Dark Souls to figure out that Hex plus Demon equals dead. The path to the old Iron King was a nice little walk across the flaming countryside, and Dark Hail combined with a large fiery boss is a perfect recipe for regicide. Back down to Sinner's Rise to cool off in the waters before we take on the Lost Sinner. This time around I elected not to light the torches to see if the fight would get any more difficult. Dark Hail is making it pretty clear though that I'm only allowed to call this a challenge by definition. Weird thought occurred to me. Would we hate Magus and Congregation as much if they didn't give them a health bar? Like, imagine if they just took away the victory text in the health bar but kept the fog walls. I think that might be a fun way to do an encounter. Sorry, things are starting to get brainless and my mind is wandering. The Duke's Dumb Refrigerator was a nice little dance, but Hexes are still taking chunks out of health bars without much effort. I think this might be the first time I've talked to Aldi on Brightstone before. Look at how big he is. Chad. In other news, I'm going through Drang Lake Guards and Cyan Knights like coffee paper, and my caffeine addiction knows no bounds. Apparently the Dragon Riders are mad that we made their brother swim with the fishes, but I genuinely can't understand anything they're saying over the sound of me not caring. Now that we're in the second half of Drang Lake Castle, it's time for another round of upgrades. First we can grab Kaitha's Chime, the second highest scaling chime for dark damage in the game. The only chime that surpasses this one is dropped by the literal final boss of the game, so we'll be using this from now on for chime spells. We can also grab the Frozen Flower, which will unlock DLC 3 for us. Heading into the frozen city of Aleum Lois, we can start maneuvering our way through enemies. Once we've passed the broken bridge and head into the tower, we head up and then drop down to the dead tree in order to pick up the Dark Clutch Ring. This ring is going to sacrifice a small amount of our defenses, but in exchange, will increase our dark damage output even further. If you translated the words, even more damage into Dranglaikin, it would probably translate to Dead Mirror. But surely things would change here. Next is the Shrine of Amana. A gauntlet of soldiers and mages amidst the cold water impeding our movement. It's going to take sheer will and concentration in order to- So that took about nine minutes. Rude. Kermit the Amphibious War Machine took about as much damage from hexes as you'd think he would, and then we made our way through the undead crypt to fight Velstat. I had a feeling he would be fairly resistant to dark damage, given that he's a caster of dark magic. That technically is the case, but it only served to lower our damage to about an average level. It may not be the bursts of damage we've been seeing, but Velstat still goes down.
Using a Dark Knight Stone we found in the crypt, we can infuse our Kaithus Chime with Dark. Now we've got a reason to potentially use this over the staff. But first, the Chime Hexes take a lot of attunement slots. To get those slots, we'll Aesthetic NASCAR back to life, and we'll take her out for the Southern Ritual Band plus two. The Chime spell we'll be focusing on is Great Resonant Soul. It drains 500 souls in order to cast, but in exchange does a large amount of damage. This is going to replace Dark Hail as our main source of damage. Before we head into Aldia's Keep, I want to try out the Dark Lurker. Maybe taking him on this early will give us that sense of battle we're so desperately craving. After clearing out the chasms of old, we make our descent to take on the Angel of Darkness. To be completely fair, the Dark Resistance is nothing to scoff at. We're outputting about the same levels of damage we did to Velstat. Although, I will say the fact that we're still doing decent damage with just basic Dark Orbs means this isn't going to give us too many issues. The Dark Lurker goes down. Our reward for defeating the Dark Lurker is Climax, a Chime Hex that works like Great Resonant Soul. However, instead of taking a set amount of souls, it takes all of our souls and bases the damage off of the amount taken up to a limit of 5,000. It's very powerful in the right situations, but I'm not going to spend too much time with it. Remember when we killed this boss and his old buddy with only the Armor of Thorns on New Game Plus? I sure wish I didn't. Sorry, the mind is doing the wandering thing again. After the Aldius Keep Running Simulator, we make our way to the Guardian Dragon, and it took me longer to type this part of the script than it took to kill him. And now I'm sitting here watching myself ride an elevator with nothing interesting to say. After grabbing the Ashen Mist Heart from the Ancient Dragon, we head into the Giant Memories to take on the Giant Lord. The best part about this fight is the Dark Fog ASMR. It's like my ears are being gently hugged by a drunk fax machine. Once the Giant Lord is down, we have some stragglers we need to clean up before we start heading to the DLC bosses. Let's do these fast. Executioner's Chariot didn't stand much of a chance. We have the ability to two-shot gargoyles, so that fight ended fairly quickly, and the rats went exactly as you'd expect they would. Time for the Ancient Dragon. Our hexes are putting in some good damage, and while Dark Fog does technically work, it's not quite worth it this time around. Dark Hail very easily racks up damage against the dragon's massive form, so we can rack up a ton of damage without too much effort. It takes two attempts before the Ancient Dragon falls. For Vendrick, things aren't necessarily super interesting. By staying close, Dark Hail can hit for most of its bursts, and that's about all we need. We probably could have used Great Resonant Soul to speed things up, but we aren't exactly in a hurry. The King Falls. And with that, we've cleared just about everything in the base game. The final boss trio is all that's left, but I usually save those for post-DLC. This is usually about when I would grind to get on level to take on the DLC bosses, but right now I'm actually feeling pretty confident. The damage I'm dealing even to late game bosses like Ancient Dragon and Vendrick is still high for what I'm used to in magic only runs, so I'm going to skip grinding for levels this time around. No breaks on this pain train, we're headed straight for the end game. A third of the script is on DLC bosses? <laughs> Jesus. Crown of the Sunken King is up first. Getting through the area wasn't too bad, although the Dark Mages did take some time to bring down. Alana is the first one up on the DLC 9. Looks like my instincts were right, our spells are doing more than enough damage. Any day I can see yellow when I hit the boss is a good day. As per usual, we clear out the skeletons every time they're summoned to prevent Velstat and get back on Alana once they're gone. Once again, we're closer to a normal boss fight than a challenge run. Alana goes down on the first try. Second of the nine is the Toxic Dragon. 
Similar idea as the Ancient Dragon, but two major differences. We're under much more threat from his attacks, and his flying makes him harder to hit than the Ancient Dragon. That being said, the damage we deal with Dark Hail is still great. As long as we don't take too many consecutive hits, this shouldn't be too much of an issue. It takes two tries before Sin goes down. The Grave Robbers are up. This is mostly a chase across the arena making use of the drops and water pools. When we can get the afflicted separated from the rest of the group, we slowly kite them down. After that, Varg isn't much of an issue, and Syrah is even easier to put down. The squad goes down on the first try. DLC number 2 is up, the Crown of the Iron King. The area here was also fairly easy to navigate, though I have experience going through here on much less fortunate builds. Even still, we weren't even remotely struggling with getting through the enemies. Next up is DLC boss 4 of 9, and my personal favorite, the Fume Knight. Great Resonant Soul's cost at this point means next to nothing, but its damage is more than welcome. We can take solid sections off of the boss's HP with singular spell casts, and we're easily more than halfway through his health bar by the time we move on to the second spell. In the end, Hex has passed the Fume Knight test on our first try. Next up on the list is the Blue Smelter. Once again, we're doing more than enough damage with Great Resonant Soul. We're not exactly the most tanky individual in Drang Lake against his attacks, but it is what it is. Overconfidence got me killed once, but second attempt and Blueberry goes down. Suralon is the last one here in Broom Tower, and we definitely deal enough damage. However, it's almost never the damage that you're dealing to this guy that's the problem. It's usually your positioning and attack windup that determines a lot when it comes to this boss. Something that I definitely had to get back into the rhythm of. That being said, once we found the beat of this dance, it was over far too soon. Alon goes down on attempt number two. Final DLC, Crown of the Ivory King. Riddle me if you've heard this one before. Ava wasn't too complicated and it only took a couple of tries, but navigating this area was slow and painful. It's the usual suspects in this DLC, but this time I had a bad problem about different invaders just... getting lost. I ended up having to time them out just by waiting out their clocks, mainly because I just couldn't find them. Made navigating this DLC about 30 minutes longer than needed. Only two DLC bosses left, and next up is the Burnt Ivory King. This one is much more of a slog. We do barely any damage to the Charred Lois Knights. Granted, we have more than enough spell casts and spell cast recovery items, but this still makes the lead up to the boss a grind. Once the King is out, the fight isn't too bad, although he can still deal a lot of damage. And dying to the Ivory King means redoing the Charred Knights again, slowly grinding away their health bars with hexes. It's not a fun process to repeat, and not one I'd necessarily add to my list of fights to revisit. Eventually though, we find a run where we can put the Burnt King down without too many issues. Only one more to go. And the last boss to go is none other than Lud and Zalin although I was definitely calling them much more creative words while recording. I'd like to say the problem here is that I take too much damage from singular attacks, but being under pressure from Ava's damage wasn't a good sign, so you can imagine Lud and Zalin being a way bigger issue. But ultimately, the real problem was the several minute run back, and after a couple of tries, I could not be bothered to repeat it. So I went and ground 23 more levels from the lovely Giant Lord and his Dark Fog ASMR, and came back a little bit stronger. And not only did that tip the scales enough to beat them, we utterly destroyed the King's pets. Not only was Lud completely dead by the time Zalin did anything, but we managed to take down the second pet without them ever getting the chance to heal or buff. It makes me wonder how badly we would have crushed the rest of the DLCs if we did end up grinding or doing extra prep. Something tells me we would have seen 9 first tries and little resistance, but I'll definitely take what I got.
Before we can call it a day though, we've got to wrap this challenge up. It's time for the final trio. Throne Watcher and Defender stand very little chance. A casting of Great Resonance Soul easily hits them for about a third of their health. No issues here. Without taking the time to get the special crowns, being under pressure by Curse, and hopefully a large defense against dark damage would make Nishandra interesting. Unfortunately, yeah, it's Nishandra. You can probably guess what happened. And finally, it was time for Aldia. To his credit, he didn't lose a third of his health to a single spellcast. So that's... something. In the end, Aldia didn't stand a chance. And with that victory, we have beaten every boss in Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin with only hexes. That was... uncomfortably easy. Don't get me wrong, getting the early route for this challenge to work was a tad tricky, but once the early game was routed, this became a steamroll. I actually felt bad initially calling this a challenge because of how easy it was, but then again, maybe that isn't such a bad thing. If you're looking for a good way to get into DS2 runs, this may not be a bad place to start. It really did emphasize how much a run can get out of control once you have a good grip on what you need and when. I can't exactly say I had fun this run, but it was nice to do something fairly brainless this run. As for next time, I'm not entirely sure what Dark Souls challenge I want to take on next, but I'm getting ready to power through some suggestions I've been banking up. I'm a machine driven by intrigue and a horrible caffeine addiction, and you can contribute to both at the same time. Let me know if you have a fun or interesting idea for a challenge in the comments below. But that's going to do it for me today. If you enjoyed the video, then please give it a thumbs up, pop that subscribe button, and ring a tingling that little bell to be notified whenever I drop another video. You can also join the Discord, link is in the description below to come chat and hang out with me and the rest of the community. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you gamers on the flip side. Later!